In this episode, we'll be talking about the difference between service improvement, service innovation and service design. We'll be talking about why you must be designing business models as a service designer. And finally, how you can become a better designer by learning from nature. And here's the guest for this episode. Hi, I'm Deborah Shebeko and welcome to the Service Design Show. If you're trying to design services that have a positive impact on people's lives and are good for business, then you've come to the right place. Hi, my name is Mark Fontein and welcome to the Service Design Show. My guest in this episode is Deborah Shebeko. Deborah is a true service design pioneer who founded the service design studio called Think Public. In the next 30 minutes, Deborah and I will be talking about three really interesting topics. What is the difference between service improvement, service innovation and service design? We'll be talking about why you must be designing business models as a service designer. And finally, how you can become a better designer by learning from nature. We post new videos on a weekly basis on this channel. So if you don't want to miss anything, I would love to have you to subscribe to this channel and click that bell icon so you'll be notified when new videos are out. And if you'd like to learn how to explain service design without confusing people, check out the free course that I've got for you. You can find it over here or in the link down below in the description of this video. So that was all for the introduction and now let's jump straight into the interview with Deborah. Welcome to the show, Deborah. Hi, Mark. It's, it's awesome to have you on and I still remember when we met back in 2007 uh, in our old, old 31 volt studio, you took the whole thing public uh, team here and we went out bowling, right? That's, I think that was what our first encounter. Yeah, did we beat you? <laughs> <laughs> Chances are slim, I, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, that was great. That feels like such a long time ago. Yeah, well, um, it, it is. <laughs> I, I, I can remember coming over and seeing you guys and um, we all had lunch together, which reminded me very much of Think Public. And then you guys got the washing up bowl out. And I was like, that's exactly like us. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, still, like, we're still doing the lunches. So that, that's, that <laughs> bowling, bowling isn't any uh, anymore in the plans, but uh, the lunches still are. Let's jump straight into the show and uh, I'm going to ask you the question that I've been asking for the past 50 episodes and that is, do you remember the first time you got in touch with service design? I know, well, I was thinking about this earlier. I think it was about 14 or 15 years ago. Um, and so I basically got into service design through um, volunteering at Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. Mm. Um, and whilst I was there, I saw so many opportunities for how design could improve communications and experience. And I guess when we start to look at experience, that's kind of at the foundations of, of service design. Um, and so that was kind of, I guess, my first step into going, well, how do we how do we design and improve these experiences? I didn't know what it was called at that point. <laughs> and then I, and when, when did you learn about the term? I think the term came probably probably in 2004 um, when I was part of the Nesta Creative Pioneer Program um, and spent quite a lot of time with the Live, Live Work gang. Um, and I think that helped to kind of, um, I guess, put meaning, put words to everything that was going on up here. Um, and it made a lot of sense. Um. All right, um, you have a long history in service design, so I'm really curious which topics you, you've picked to talk about. Um, I've got three topics here, you've got some question starters and that's part of the show to do actually co-create on the fly. Uh, are you ready? I'm ready, All right. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> let's, I'll, I'll pick the first uh, topic and this is an interesting one because it's, it's called uh, improvement design or innovation, uh, it's quite cryptic. Do you have a question starter that goes along with this one? Yeah, so my question starter is, I guess, how do you know what type of service design you're actually doing um, or should be doing, um, depending on the context in which you're working in? Um, so that's kind of my question. Are, are there different of forms of service design? Well, I think there's different forms of being a service yeah. designer. Um, and I think that this is something within the discipline that the, I, I see that there's lots of different types of service designers that may be better on different types of projects. Um, and so, for example, um, at Think Public, we, we did a lot of like service improvement work, which was actually 
um, you know, obviously within the NHS, when budgets are limited, you don't get to design a service from scratch very often. Um, and also, you, you just don't have that kind of resource. So what you have to do is take the existing service and system and co-design and work with people to make improvements. So our role as designers is very different we end up being more kind of facilitators and empowering people to be the designers to create the change themselves. So I'd say that's the kind of foundations of like service improvement. Um, and But it's still service design. Um, so, and then I think when you then kind of move on to more like service innovation and more projects, which actually, um, will start from, I guess, the ground where they're like, we just, don't know what it is we want to design so there's much more place and opportunity um, and potentially quite often the budgets are slightly bigger um, <laughs> and people also are trying to design for the future more and that takes a very different type of design obviously we still need to um, gain really good insights and understand the the problems that we're trying to solve but we're also trying to dream and create what a future could be um, and so I guess it's a it's a balance of when you're um, you're a designer and you're listening and you're learning um, and you're facilitating, but then you also flip into leadership mode where as a designer, you do bring some kind of special design magic, which is hard to explain. Um, and that's where we can start to kind of create ideas that weren't possible before. Um, so I kind of guess that's why I put that question there, because I think sometimes if we're if we're in a service improvement project, but we have a service innovation mindset, the solution's never going to work. Mm, yes. um, and so we have to kind of adapt to the context in which we're working in. And how do we, is, 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 a, is there a really strict uh, way of knowing which kind of mindset we have to adopt? Um, I don't think it's necessarily strict. I think it's a, it's a lot to do with, um, I guess, really understanding the problem um, and the client and the system in which you're designing a solution for. Um, and being having having kind of empathy for the situation um, and not trying to kind of enforce something if it's, it's not the right context to be doing that. <clears throat> If you, if you say everything is still service design, e either if it's improvement or innovation, what is the thing that ties it all together? Um, ooh, I think it's a lot to do with like the tools and the methodology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, you know, I think you, you can go through a service design and I always kind of frame it also like co-production methodology, whether you're doing, um, a really short project or a really long project, or whether you're doing a service improvement project or an innovation project, you still need to have a really good foundation of insights. Um, you still need to kind of work with people to create ideas. And I think it's just it's learning at what stage to, I guess, dial up and dial down design leadership within each of those projects. Mm. And, and so if I would have to frame it. One of the big differences at, uh, within these three things is your starting point. Your starting point differs, mm -hmm. right? Your, your, your starting challenge probably differs. I, and maybe the outcome uh, or the ambition or the goal is always the same. We want to create services that are better for people and, and business and the planet maybe, but the starting point might differ. Yeah, I think, I think this, the starting point or the, que the question or the state of the question maybe that someone comes to you with. Because very often, I, I imagine for many people working in service design, people don't come with a brief. Um, they come with a problem or they think it's the problem. But then when you start researching, you realize that's not the problem. Um, and so I think it's, it's also, I guess, knowing where that organization is in their kind of journey of understanding of design and innovation. So I always say, how brave do you want to be? And so if you think that a client's going to be brave, then you could probably do, but they also need to make change today. You could blend service improvement and service innovation. Um, and I guess it's just about managing that relationship and trying to help people take a step forward to being bold. Um, because obviously what you don't want to do is end up just make like 
twiddling around the edges, um, even though there is value because we can make a big difference, particularly in healthcare, by making small changes. But actually, sometimes we really need to have a radical change. If, if, maybe one final thing regarding this topic. If you would have to give some sort of advice to service designers regarding this topic, what, what would your advice be or based on the lessons you've gained in the last 10, 12, 13 years? I think a lot of it's about people skills um, and I think that when it comes to like having a design team that have really um, really strong people skills, the ability to listen, um, understand, have empathy um, is, is key because I think then it removes the ego from the design process and I think that's probably one difference, particularly in the types of um, design pro uh, projects that I've worked in, in the social sector, you, 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 the ego has to kind of be left behind a bit because you're working with um, areas that you have like literally no knowledge about so you need experts in the room and you need to be able to listen and be able to kind of connect the dots um, and sometimes if designers don't listen then they'll miss out the magic <laughs> all right are you ready to move on to topic number two yeah all right okay. um i've got two left oh okay let's go for this one drum roll it's the topic number two is called designing business models. Uh, do you have a question starting? Can you show it? Can you show the paper? Do you have it near? Oh, Let's see. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> All right. So how can we and what do you make out of this? So um, the, the, I could ask so many different how can we's, but the one that I guess to start off with is like, how can, how can we use um, our design skills? skills to um, disrupt business models and system structures um, and I think it's something that I'm, I'm really interested in I guess the role of how design is changing and more and more we see actually like design activisms, design entrepreneurs um, and I think that a lot of the social challenges that we see today actually probably need new business models or new system structures in order to be able to really tackle and change just of that problem. Um, and so I, I'm always kind of really aware whenever designing a service, you're actually quite often designing a business um, because it's it's not like designing, um, I don't know, like a poster. There you go. You put it on the wall. <laughs> it's good. You're finished. It's actually you're designing a living system. Mm -hmm. um, and quite often that has human interactions. It has technology. Um, it'll have to have information put into them. And so all of these things need to be funded in some way. They need to fit within um, either an existing organization or they need to be made into a new organization um, and so it's really important I think for service designers to think like um, to think like entrepreneurs and to think about all of the different inputs and outputs and how is this going to be financially sustainable um, beyond this project um, particularly I guess a lot of us work in consultancies where we're given a set amount of money to to make something and then hand over but actually how can you hand it over in the best state in order to succeed once you've left yeah, the, the business component the business model component is sort of uh, is vital you can't ignore that within a, a good service design project Exactly. And I, th I, I think that quite often the, the, the radical forms and using business modeling as part of the creative process much earlier on, I think is really important um, and not kind of like designing something that, um, I, I don't know, just is in a bubble. And I mean, it doesn't, it, it, it happens. And I think it's just really important that particularly in design education, that people come out with some kind of level of awareness of what, how to create a business, a business model. Um, and I guess there's lots of different canvases that we can use that, that help with that. But I think it's an area that needs, needs more thinking. This has been a topic quite often on the show uh, <laughs> recently, because if we're not able to connect our solutions and to make them business-wise sustainable, then like you're saying, we're designing stuff uh, in a bubble, right? It, it's not, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense. And, no. and you said one of the things is that uh, design schools need to play an active role in this. Is, is that where you see the big gap happening? 
Um, partly, I guess also that comes through experience, but I, I think it's 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 just being really aware of not I guess not just the business model, but also like the policy context. It's just the whole system for what you're designing for, because you could come up with a great idea, but it's just never going to work because someone downstream is being impacted by it. Um, and so I feel like the it it's awareness for from students all the way through to industry that let's not just create these lovely pilot projects actually let's think about who or what organizations might take these on to scale who's who's got an interest in solving this problem and i think the other bit linked to that is that quite often it's about creating new forms of partnership right from the outset um, and so we might have a, a certain challenge when we're actually as a design agency we know that we need to bring in um, a commercial partner or a third sector partner or, or a particular partner in order to have the backbone to that service so it has the potential to kind of live um, and it, it, yeah it's it's just creating the right conditions um, and bringing people also in in the right mindset to work together in a collaborative way and I'm, I'm I'm sort of starting to think about um, where you know the boundaries of service design is still uh, should we still consider the service design and I'm not I don't want to get into semantics of or mm. debates about what service design and, and service design isn't but can we yeah is, is this still service design that that's basically <clears throat> I guess the question is I, I'm not quite sure actually I, I think there's like I think the, the 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 with service design there's lots of blurry boundaries um, and so I guess what I'm what I'm not saying is I think that designers need to be able to write a fully fledged business plan but what I am saying is that they need to have a very they have to have an understanding of it um, and understand the context of it because otherwise it, it, their creativity is limited um, and so it's a bit like say for example with AI um, and the development of AI it's like well I don't know anything about AI but I also have a responsibility to learn the basics of what it, it what it means, mm -hmm. um, because that is going to be something that impacts a lot of the design solutions. Um, and so, as service designers, I think you have to you have to be a bit of um, a bit of jack of all trades sometimes, just in a generalist level, and then be able to bring in the experts when you need to go deeper. Makes sense. Makes makes complete sense. What is um when you think about this topic and try to fast forward it to three or five years, how do you see this topic evolving? Um, I, I guess partly I'm really interested in um, like value chains um, and how, I guess, depending on what the problem is, how maybe you bring in existing businesses um, to create a new value chain. So you, sometimes as, as designers, service designers, we might find ourselves actually not even designing anything, but saying, well, actually this already exists, but what we're gonna do is connect it with something else and help it scale. Um, and then actually you've created a whole new value chain that has a, has a bigger impact. So I think, some, I think it feels like we'll probably enter, entering a phase where we don't really sometimes even need to design any more stuff. We're, so we're orchestrating. We're orchestrating things much more, right? Yeah, um, and there's so many great things out there, but it's just about yeah how you connect them to to, to scale. I think that's the biggest challenge. Mm. All right, time to move already to topic number three, and this is a completely different topic. So that that's really fun. Um, we've moved from the business side to something that hasn't been on the show that often, to be honest, and that is. Learning from nature, <laughs> again, <coughs> the, the, the classic, how can we? So um, this is um, a, how can we um, go back to basics and explore our relationship to ourselves and to nature uh, in order to inspire um, design solutions, ideas that tackle social issues. So where is this question coming from? 
Um, I'm a bit of a secret hippie. Uh, <laughs> not anymore, now I've told you. You're out in um, the open. <laughs> I, I, I think it, it, it comes from, I guess, within all of the work that I've ever um, taken part in. I think one of the things that's always struck me is the power of connecting people and the power of when those people have a conversation with each other, what's possible. Um, and I think quite often we forget about that and we, I see, you know, there's, there's so much technology that's coming on the market and which is all super exciting. Um, and, you know, we're going to have chatbots that will be able to give advice and stuff like that. But it's, it, and I, I, a big, I'm a big fan of all of that stuff, but I think we really need to um, make sure that we're grounded when, when designing with, um, with technology. Um, and I think it's about looking at beyond that and reversing our thinking and looking back to actually how, how the planet works and how the earth, how the earth kind of, um, is actually giving giving messages and we can learn from that. So, so you know, what does it actually, I guess I can pose some questions, like what does it actually mean to be human? Um, what does, um, uh, what role um, does human connection play in, in tackling social, social issues? Um, like what's the role in looking at how trees, for example, are planted in the earth and they go through cycles of the season? Um, you know, so for example, when we you look at winter that then moves into spring, so that then moves into summer and autumn. And it actually, if you look at a design process, quite often we go through stages where things need to be seeded, they need to be nurtured, they, then they start to come to life. And there's a natural kind of flow. Um, and I feel like that we need to get outside more, connect with nature, <laughs> and also talk to each other more as human beings um, on a really deep level to be able to kind of think very differently about how we solve some of these problems. Um, and so some, some other kind of examples are like, I mean, I guess we're, we're starting to learn a lot about how the gut, the gut works um, and actually within our own gut, there are ways that we can find things to treat different diseases or in in Japan like how it's, it's a massive movement around forest bathing and how forest bathing is really good for our mental health um, and our blood pressure um, and to reduce stress and so it's actually maybe some of our design solutions aren't going and having a mobile phone but they're taking your shoes off and going for a walk in the forest um, that's quite a cheap solution mm, uh, yes. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think it's also around, I guess we, we talk a lot about like systems thinking, but it, it kind of links into actually like systems feeling, how do we, what does it feel like what we've created and how are the humans, the people actually going to interact and what changes in their life is it going to make? Because ultimately I'm a big believer in change only happens through people. Um, and so without empowering people, nothing's going to happen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, uh, so a lot of uh, to process, but I, I think I, I, I definitely get your message and um, I'm trying to relate this to myself. And is it that we're, is that service designers or designers in general trust too much on tools and processes and technology and uh, too little on themselves? Potentially, yes. I mean, I think that the tools and processes are like a structure that's great and you could be trained to use all the tools and systems in, in the world, but still not be very good um, because actually there is a bit of into there is intuition that's needed um, and obviously data to back that up. But that's kind of like the, the data come, and that side of things sometimes comes in as a protection, whereas actually if we are all more to trust our intuition, um, I think that actually we'd a lot more a lot more cool stuff would kind of come through and we would trust it. Yeah, and I think that I, I, that was exactly the point I was trying to make, that if we trust ourselves at least just as much as we trust the process, then probably much better solutions would come out, right? Yeah, exactly. And actually, I think there's a really simple exercise that you can do where you you sit down and, and you talk to someone and 
you really listen to that person and not listen because quite often when we're having a conversation our mind is thinking about what we're going to say and how we're going to respond rather than actually listening deeply to understand and actually the change in relationship of that dynamic of conversation is really powerful when the other person feels that they've been heard um and it's so simple and i feel like particularly in health obviously which i work a lot in i feel like people don't feel like they're being listened to or heard um and so things that can help with that could actually be really really powerful mm, that's an awesome tool already if we want to trust the tool deeply listening mm. right what has set you on this uh path what what has happened in your life that you thought okay we need to i need to explore this more um i think it's always been part of um always been part of my practice i mean at, at think public we you know we've had shamans in we've had lots of random things where um we've kind of i guess connected with the the kind of spiritual sides and the the the, the nature and i i also believe that like even design is a create is a creative process which is a magical process and so it feels like it feels like I've always been in that space and I feel like actually more recently that the the volume of actually talking about this stuff um, needs to be turned up. Um, and so say for example, mindfulness has become a really big movement now. Um, and so I think that really opens up the potential to talk about more kind of holistic ways in which we can solve problems. Um, and I, I mean, personally, I, I'm still kind of trying to figure it out myself, but I feel like there's so much potential and power in that space. Um, well, where do you get your inspiration from? Or if I frame this question uh, in a different way, if people are inspired by what you just already said, what would you advise them to find more, dive deeper into this? What, what are good resources, references? Um, I was reading um, I was reading John Facker's new book, which I've completely forgotten. I think it's like designing. I've forgotten what we'll it's put called. A link, uh, we'll put a link in the episode show notes. Yeah, uh, um, and he talks, and he's always been very interested in um, ecology, and um, but it's it's less so that I think I'm also interested in like the shamanic pro processes of going it having a challenge having a, a, a challenge a problem and then going into a create a deep creative meditation ultimately um to find a solution and so quite often if you think when we're looking for solutions um and we're ideating we bounce ideas around and it's very much from our head um and so i guess what i'm saying is how do we actually stop um and actually go inside ourselves um, either collectively or individually to be inspired with new solutions. Um, and so there's lots of interesting kind of ways um, in which you can do that. And one of the things that also like is sound meditation is a great way of doing that too. Um, and or just literally going for a walk um, without your phone in, in the woods somewhere and connecting with nature. And I think that a lot of us actually neglect that part of our lives because we're also busy we feel busy right yes. yeah I, I i'm i know what i'm going to do this weekend <laughs> <laughs> put my phone away and and uh and you know taking time and uh taking it, it feels like taking a break but it's actually not taking a break right that, that's a totally wrong mindset you're you're actually creating things by not doing anything, or at least not not doing anything uh, in your head. Yeah, and and it, I mean, we all, I guess, we could all recognise that some of the best ideas come when you're in the shower, say exactly. for example, exactly. yeah. and you're not yeah. even thinking about it. And so it's like, actually, how can we access that quicker mm. um, and make that part of our just general process? That's an awesome question. <laughs> How can we uh, access the, the state of mind that you encounter in a shower quicker? That, that would be it. <laughs> I, I love that. Um, Deborah, we're uh, heading towards the end of the show. We're not yet there yet uh, because I have a question for you. And that is, 
this is your opportunity to ask the people who are watching or listening this episode a question. Is there something you'd like to know from us? Um, I think my question would be around how do we how do we actually spread um, like a service design co-production way of thinking to engage more people um, in this process? Because I think that quite often when talking about it to people that haven't been involved in a project before, it's really hard to explain because you don't have a physical thing to show this is what it is. Um, you say, well, once you've done it, you'll, you'll know what it feels like. Um, yeah. And it's like, okay, great. We need to get everyone to do this so they know what it feels like. Because generally, in my experience, once people have used this approach, they want to use it again. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes back to that kind of magic. How can we, yeah, how can we get more people to kind of get the vibe? How can we let them experience it without having experienced it? Yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. I'm, I'm really curious what people have to say about this. Leave a comment down below uh, on this episode. Let's see what comes in. Um, Deborah, I want to thank you for making time, sharing uh, some of your thoughts. It inspired me a lot. So uh, thanks again for being, for being here. Thanks for inviting me, Mark. So what is your favorite tool to actually learn from nature? Leave your tips down below in the comments. And if you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you click that thumbs up button. And of course, if you know someone who might benefit from the things we've just discussed, please share this video with them. If you want to learn how to explain service design without making it sound like brain surgery, check out the free course I've got for you over here or click the link down below in the description of this video. Thanks again for watching and I look forward to see you in the next video.